This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, hope all is well out there. Uh, I know it's been crazy and I hope this is a little bit of sanity brought into your life for this week. We've got a ton of games, so much though that it pushed all the way out into December. The RPG episode actually has a little bit more this time than the board game episode, which is kind of rare. So I've got my bottle of apple pie flavored Baileys that I'm going to be enjoying as we go through all the different campaigns. And uh, it's the first time it's going to rain here in LA in months, I think since like March or February. So I'm really happy about that. Hopefully it'll clean up all the streets and the air and all the cool stuff that, that uh, <laughs> we can do afterwards. Maybe it'll even bring some snow into the hills and people can uh, ski or whatever later. So I'm looking forward to that. We got more cool stuff to look forward to, such as a sponsorship by Crippled God Foundry. Very, very thankful for them for promoting their Shattered Hell uh, campaign, which is a bunch of STL files, or you can get them printed by the people at Crippled God, and they'll send it to you in resin. And these are demon-themed. Uh, they would work really well in Descent under Avernus, or if you did any of your own type of uh, celestial versus abyssal kind of campaigns so take a quick look they do offer some free goatmen so that part is also awesome that you could sample their wares and uh, get one for yourself right now for free they've got another week or so on the campaign let's see what else is on there taking a more in-depth look you can see that there are some heroes that have been uh, selected these chosen of the gods they are more along the lines of what you would see in like a demigod and if you were playing the Theros book from it's like Mythic Odysseys of Theros, I think is the, the full name, that these would work really well for any demigods that you chose in there. There's a bunch of rules that are in that book specifically so that you can expand out and have uh, more gifts from the gods, things that you earn on your, your epic journey. And it's supposed to be more like a Greek play as opposed to, or, you know, like one of the, the Greek myth, uh, mythology stories as opposed to just... A random adventure and any of these folks would look really really cool on your table paint them up however you'd like or you can print more if you want to make them like a village or whatever the case is that part is up to you and uh, you'll be able to have a more epic character you might be able to scale it up or down depending on sizes uh, and depending on how good your printer is and uh, make things work out pretty well for you so lots of options there for heroes for player characters or NPCs people that could give quests or you know people that could be patrons possibly and to make sure that your table is fully decked out with things for all levels to fight with you have other types of beasts that you can see such as the goatmen that were mentioned before you can get the free sample of you have different types of gnolls and some interesting poses both male and female versions of them and the so-called Elysium warriors these could be bandits undead warriors guards whatever it is that you want to paint them up as or utilize them as so these are very versatile for lower uh, class or lower level uh, individuals that uh, might be just starting out, especially if you're going to do Theros and it's a whole new world that doesn't necessarily take place in the same plane as uh, Faerun and you'd be able to jump in right away with uh, a bunch of these guys, however many of them that you think you would need. There's even multi-limbed Amazonian hell beasts in case you need those to uh, be able to fight and all the genders possible <laughs> out there in the Blood War or wherever it is that you're going to use these guys for. So there's some epic monster types as well that you can pick up. This is the size comparison between the normal ones and the heroes, demigod, that type. And then they have some really giant uh, other ones that you can get, including... Um, there's the one you can use as Tiamat if you needed to. They, they call it Echidna. And that's supposed to be like the mother of all things awful and terrible in the Greek world. But you can also, like I say, use it for a, a Tiamat or for uh, some other type of multi-headed uh, Hydra type uh, thing. If you're going to play as Bellerophon against them or whatever the case is. You just like it on the shelf. There are some other nightmare type of creatures. One of them looks like a cross between a fairy and a xenomorph. If that... Uh, helps you out and uh, lots of just other types of regular demons and that kind of stuff so crippled god they've got a good reputation if you looked at them on kick track right now they're the top tabletop game campaign out there and uh, as we've seen in our previous episodes that they've sponsored episode that they've sponsored 
they uh, have a Patreon as well that you can check out and get minis from them all the time. And, and they're really responsive with their community through Discord. And uh, they'll be able to help you get on a monthly basis all kinds of new crate wonderful stuff that uh, you can print off. Or as I stated in, earlier, they, will ha they do have a service where they can print things for you. And you can just re receive them that way if you don't want to put it in the expense time and effort and space of having the uh, resin printers yourself. I want to thank them again for being incredibly generous. And now we're on to the regular parts of the episode. This is Tyrants from the Tor. And these folks are some nasty metal ogres and trolls that you can use anywhere you want. They uh, can be painted any way if you want. Right now they've gone uh, very green. <laughs> and uh, that's that part's up to you. They look a little bit like a cross between what you'd find in Never Ending Story and uh, some type of fairy tale book. Like the, the rock troll, uh, what a rock biter, whatever it was called. They look a little bit like that um it's kind of neat uh it just depends on if it's going to fit within the aesthetic of the other stuff that you already have trolls are a very varied uh type of creature that have all different types of weaknesses usually to fire acid uh, or some other special uh type of uh, uh problem they don't necessarily always have clothes on so these ones are a little bit more civilized than what you might find and uh you know that they're, they're not really known for intelligence but the uh, possibility always exists that maybe you run into one that uh, isn't so dumb and uh, understands what's going on out there so if these guys fit your your world if you, or just as something that you feel like you'd want to paint i'm sure these folks in the uk would be really happy to uh, help you out with this we have a scenery campaign this is the mysterious kingswood and uh, these folks are all uh, squares. You, they're not the ones offering hexes. I think there's some later in the episode that are on hexes that you can pick up from another company. Uh, it just depends on what it is that you're trying to build. There's lots of different stone entryways for uh, if it's a hole of some kind or something, you know, um, where the hobbits go uh, uh, when they're getting chased by the uh, orcs and whatnot. Uh, in Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, you can make entrances like that. Um, if there's some dinosaur skeletons that you can use as maybe for like dragons and uh, maybe some trees even that you could talk to. So there's lots of different variations depending on the type of enchanted or strange woods, plains, uh, plateaus, whatever the case is that you might have. If uh, you're in need of your game being a uh, square based uh, or rectangular based uh, setup, then you can use this for whatever role-playing and or wargaming terrain needs you might have. And it's fairly inexpensive and it's simple enough to not be scary on whatever printer you're going to need, but uh, also pretty good looking. So however you need to end up painting it, it'll look just right. Then we have the first time that I've seen some third-party books for Morkborg. And they seem to have followed that same aesthetic of uh, you have the yellow on the pages and kind of a monochromatic... Uh, theme for the pictures on the inside uh, very much an old-school like ballpoint pen kind of look uh, that you would normally get from the older uh, The older horror themed books that are out there This one is strange citizens of the city and it is not the only one on this list for uh, Morkborg so if you've been looking for something that is more of an old-school kind of trippy vibe and you're just tired of the way that the other books kind of all look the same this one definitely does not. Those yellow pages are very striking, but they're not offensive to the eye. Sometimes you get a little too high in certain colors and the, there's just too much light uh, reflected back and it stresses out your eyeballs. This uh, does not do that. It feels a little bit like what you could get in like a Kingdom Death situation. Um, it would fit really well if you were had players of, of Kingdom Death and you wanted to kind of bring it more into an RPG space then this would work pretty well. I'm surprised at how well this book particularly is doing because, uh, I mean, Morkborg seems like it's hasn't been out for very long. But uh, this one, you know, if you've got uh, murder hobos ready to go, they are ready to set you up with a strange city full of people to, to give you quests and whatnot. And if you haven't already delved into the Rime of the Frost Maiden and you're looking for a Christmas adventure for 5e, then uh, here we have the Terror at Wynachten. Why Nachten? I think it's the Why Not is what it <laughs> translates to. Ah, uh, my German, uh, Dutch, whatever it's actually is supposed to be translated, is terrible, as in non-existent. 
but uh, you may need a Christmas adventure to play with the folks that you're uh, enjoying Thanksgiving or uh, Christmas, whatever the case is. Uh, maybe you just have some random whatever types of holidays. It is expected to deliver in December 2020. There's only eight uh, monsters added to this, so it's not a big adventure. However, Tim Krause has done a couple of dozen uh, successful Kickstarters and uh, makes a lot of different adventures and other things. So he knows what he's doing, and if this is for you, if you wanted something, maybe you could bring somebody uh, new from the table. Maybe you've got... Uh, uh, a new relative that's hooked up with somebody and you want to be able to bring them in and enjoy a new adventure then maybe this is a good starting off uh, point instead of something that is a little more uh, involved like uh, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden if, uh, if you want to do it that way. And then we're back with Morkborg. This is the Masticator Gate. Masticate means to chew and that's what you need teeth for. This has lots and lots of teeth like a sarlax pit but this time it goes in reverse and spews out demons instead of sucking them all in. This is also under third party license, although it uh, does maintain the same quality of, uh, of visuals and the same type of like yellow pages in order to, uh, to keep everything set really well. I'm not sure where they find all these people that uh, with the art kind of gels so well between the different books. That part's pretty cool, even though it does have a, a rather like I say, a unique style. So if you want to uh, be vomited out by a Sarlacc pit, then maybe the Masticator Gate is for you. It is uh, also has some like card decks, the way that it, it tells its story. As you can see there with the, the crow person on the left, I don't know if it's a Kenku or if it's just like a skeleton crow from a, a pagan culture. But uh, whatever the case is, you can kind of like change things out and build things up using the card decks. And that is very helpful as well. So if you want something more horror themed, then jump on in with Morkborg. And uh, you can look through for more of the books uh, that they've already created. And they're always on Kickstarter, but I'm sure they're also available uh, through their own websites if you just look up Morkborg. And then I thought maybe I should uh, pick something up myself that will help me with the hobby that I'm enjoying the most, which is painting right now, and maybe learn how to do things right. So the Minipedia by Scale 75 has multiple volumes from different professional painters about how to prep, how to properly uh, paint the different minis. I don't like the way that most people paint the, the minis. They seem like they've um, forgotten any reality and they have everything super stylized. In this book, the way that they did skin tones, the way they do faces, I really like how they made it very realistic and it wasn't like too heavy on um, really hard lines of shadow or hard lines of highlights that uh, are fine for tabletop but it just wasn't in my soul uh, what I see from a lot of folks and this is more in line with with me trying to get closer to that reality um, and uh, and through reality create personality that people can see and want to get more engaged with it's just how I feel about it and uh, I I'm back in the books. So if you would also like to learn how to be a better painter, maybe you can find some things in here. There are a lot of different scales of miniatures also available and paints that are also available if you need that kind of thing to get started. Then we have the Zodiac War, which is another set of busts and minis that you can print off yourself going to different scales. As you can see, they go from 30 to 70 millimeters and uh, they can get pretty big. Uh, based on Zodiac, you can also just get busts which uh, depending on the type of paint setup uh, you have, maybe you, it will give more space for the things that you're really looking to highlight, highlight with your skills, such as the faces, and they won't otherwise get too big, or you can get the full scale models. Um, Yadaro has been on the channel before. They've come out with a bunch of different lines. So if you're interested in this line, there might be more models that you can get from them if you check them out, or uh, just go on and send them a message and find out where else they're, uh, they're selling their stuff at. And Ian Lovecraft is continuing his line of desert adventures. It has done exceptionally well on this campaign. And uh, there's just more stuff. The sphinxes, chariots, um, djinn, different types of watchtowers. So you can make a full city, including all the different scattered terrain and things that you might need. Set it in various time periods. If it's like a, an early uh, dynasty or late dynasty, depending on uh, the level of deterioration 
that uh, has gone on with the different monuments. There's uh, various options to choose from. So if you were planning on uh, a Thousand and One Nights type campaign, or you just enjoy <laughs> having things out in a uh, Middle Eastern desert, then uh, I think you'll enjoy yourself quite a bit uh, printing these things out. I don't really see a whole lot else fulfilling the need for this um, time period and this type of art, be it Assyrian, Egyptian, or whatever the case is, that uh, is being met uh, except by uh, these campaigns for me in Lovecraft. So if you need it, now's a good time to get it. And maybe you need a big city in a medieval world in Europe. And that's what Lycum I have no idea if I'm saying that correctly, but I'm going to guess that that's going to work for everybody. And we can just move on and say, there's buildings of various types. You got tower gates, you got houses, you got multiple stories. If you're a fan of the Shadowversity channel, then he's got a bunch of different episodes that tell you why uh, in the medieval period the buildings are built this way. And a lot of it has to do with balance and being able to throw out your poop um, and heat things a certain way. And uh, just the way that they had to live based on uh, the types of materials they had available and various structures and, and the best way to uh, make them solid and strong. So if uh, you want to keep it in that vein, you want to keep it uh, in that kind of feel with something that looks pretty accurate to me that you can play on the inside or the outside. Here is 3D layered scenery's version of a medieval metropolis that you can print out for yourself. And if you like stuff a little bit later in the medieval, or not medieval, but in the European world, we have the D sanction. This is the Elizabethan agents of the supernatural. And uh, as you can see, it's a pretty simple uh, design uh, RPG. It's not something that has more than a couple different stats. John D was a mathematician, a philosopher, alchemist, whatever uh, Victoria needed in the uh, 1500s maybe into the early 1600s but i think it was uh, mid to late 1500s that he did his thing you can look up quite a bit a little bit of a fascinating guy did he get a lot of stuff wrong of course he did but uh he's one of those folks trying to do his best and uh if you were trying uh, also to have a fun adventure in this kind of world where magic is still uh, uh, in there somewhere and science is trying to move its way in as the renaissance is uh kind of going on at that the the time then this could be a, uh, a fun adventure for you, especially if you're from the UK and you know uh, a lot more than I do about it. This comes up rolled up instead of in a book format, so you can get that in this uh, type of fabric. That's what they're laying it out to make it uh, a little more thematically uh, attuned to uh, the time period. If uh, you're interested in any of those ideas, if you're looking for something that's light on magic, and uh, heavy on politics and intrigue and uh, the court and all that, give them a shot. Then we have something entirely different. Uh, I wasn't sure if this is all in Italian or if it's going to be in Italian and English. Uh, the artwork looks fantastic though, so just in case you were a fan, maybe you'd want to give it a look and see if maybe they're going to come up with an English version. Um, it's a techno fantasy world, so it's a mix of as the previous game was more towards reality with a little bit of magic thrown in this is where both technology and magic have been embraced there's fantasy creatures and all that kind of cool stuff lots of really nice artwork on the uh the page if you want to check it out or get some inspiration for different ideas i mean look at the guy you make a perfect warforged there on the right and uh but that's not going to be the world it's an entirely different kind of setup it's not going to follow as far as i can tell even though my italian sucks um <laughs> if that it's going to be uh you know a uh, uh, 5e compatible so a tenamaki hopefully you'll see it we'll know if, uh, later on if it's compatible with english and uh there are some english like paragraphs and different things that are um i m might just have it being translated automatically by chrome i'm not really sure but i don't want you to miss out on anything cool so take a look if you're interested in the art then if you feel like you missed out on halloween especially in the 80s then 5th Evolution Camp Timberwolf may be for you. This is a 5E compatible modern horror adventure. It takes place in 1983. It's got a pig face dude with a chainsaw you can see there. Uh, it looks like it's made like comic book format size to give you that kind of feel. Like the old EC comics and that kind of stuff. Uh, black and white, not the end of the world. Just saves on cost a little bit. Uh, it gives you room for your own imaginings. And if you wanted to play 
uh, versus a slasher like Jason or Leatherface or whatever the case is, then uh, maybe this is a good time to jump in. You can throw in some characters like an Ed Gein who uh, just has some uh, questionable furniture maybe, uh, different types of weird inclinations. Maybe there's some uh, uh, ghosts and other weird things that you could put in from like the American Horror Story, the 80s um episodes that were just released i think it was last season maybe it was the season before they weren't the worst I, I, I still had fun watching it um a lot of it was because it was based in la i think a lot of people didn't uh, pick up uh, on the uh, the la isms but or the california isms that uh, happened in there i thought it was fun this might be just as much fun and uh get your slasher on why not then we have a full heaping helping of the undead the easiest, the best, most exciting thing to blow up because there's always going to be more of them and you don't care because they're already dead. Um, you can just murder Hobo all you want and not murder anything. You're just defeating them. This is a pack by My Mad Goblin Miniatures to create lots of hordes of skeletons, hags, whatever things that you think you may be absent of that you need way, way more of. They have a bunch of different types of sculpts. So it's usually like five per, uh, some that have swords, some that don't have swords, some that are on the ground, some that are not. There's uh, one that's called a pumpkin blight, uh, which is kind of neat. It's like a, like a pumpkin and a spider and a scarecrow with an anglerfish all thrown in together. And you also have a bunch of different terrain and bases and things that uh, I just didn't have the room to be able to show you. They look pretty intricate though. So I would say resin is your buddy and um if you can print it out that would be great uh the swords and things they may break uh but i think that the 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 new uh, resins are starting to get a little bit better and a little bit more resilient you won't have to worry too much about it and if they did break you just print another one uh, but the bases all look pretty cool things that i'd have to make out of cork otherwise and uh, if you want to save yourself a little bit of hassle maybe you'll pick these up but give it a look and maybe you think you got enough regular zombies. Maybe you need some special zombies. What about animal zombies? Zolacost Miniatures has zombie animals of various types. You got horses and bears and birds and moose and foxes and all kinds of things that may be in the woods or maybe not. And you get their regular counterparts as well. So you can do like a before and after pet cemetery kind of situation. They all look pretty cool. They all look like they could fit in lots of different biomes. And you can pick them up wherever they are. One of the things, uh, it was a, man, it was a story. Uh, it was uh, Paffinroth or something was the editor's name. Uh, I think it's called History is Dead. Where they had one, like uh, a bunch of cavemen ate a woolly mammoth that was actually a zombie woolly mammoth. And they all end up get sick and trying to like eat each other and crazy stuff. That can happen in your stories and in your towns if uh, they eat the wrong zombie animal. And, uh, you know, why not have a, a ghost ride on one of them, too? That could be fun. Put a gnome right in the back of a, of a dead silverback or something. And then we got some good old-fashioned pig-faced orcs, bugbears, and all that kind of fun stuff here from uh, Joe Cursaro. And apparently they've... I, I don't know who Kev Adams is. If they're legendary, that part's cool. Um, but they do look like the things that you'd find in old-school... Uh, fantasy books, um, either if they're for RPGs or even regular storybooks that you might read as a kid. Um, 28 millimeters means they'll fit with everything that you've bought already, and um, they do look cool. Uh, whatever uh, thing that is that you're looking for, not all orcs are necessarily pig-faced um, like this, and uh, some of them are are more human-shaped. So you. It's really up to you to figure out what your preferred aesthetic is. If you're going to uh, play some old school uh, games or versions of AD&D or regular D&D, &D, then they're going to go more towards this than they would if you were to buy like Zombicide Green Horde or uh, one of the other, I don't know, Besieged had a bunch of orcs that don't look like this. So it's really going to depend on what your aesthetic is that you're trying to hit. I think the bugbears look pretty cool. Even if you didn't want it to be bugbears, um, they might even make good goblins or some other type of uh, interesting creature. And uh, if that's what you need, then you can get it here. And then for those of you that use hexes, we have Dungeon Quest. You can get them with or without, and you can get them also pre-oriented, um, ready to go. Uh, I don't know how to... I'm forgetting how to say it. Pre-supported. 
That was the word, pre-supported. And these will fit basically on a resin printer. Why do you want to do pre-supported? Uh, not all people are comfortable uh, setting up the supports or letting their slicer do it themselves. So it's uh, very helpful, especially if you're gonna buy close to 150 different models that are here and uh, printing them all out yourself. Uh, it can save you uh, quite a bit of time getting it just right. And maybe uh, the designer will have some good ideas of uh, where to put the support so that uh, you uh, you won't miss out on any particular detail or attach it to anything that particularly fragile. So uh, if you need anything, these folks in Spain have quite a selection of different things. And like I said, these ones are hex-based if you need that versus what uh, the square ones that were on previous campaigns in this episode. Then we have some chibi style uh, epics and stuffs, miniatures. This is the Shroomy Invasion, and they are fun little toad guys, myconids, and you can even get one for yourself, paint it up, and uh, make it Christmas themed if that's your inclination or whatever other type of weird uh, fuzzy cap you might need uh, on a mushroom. And these guys can be used a lot of different types of campaigns. They don't necessarily, because they aren't. Uh, necessarily an animal like a fungoid uh, fungi is a different uh, kingdom from animals plants totally separate uh, that would make it make sense if you were trying to integrate it with a more um, anatomically accurate version of people or different types of monsters and animals and that kind of thing and these cutesy folks would still fit in that world because being a mushroom folk would be such a difference from uh, being any other type of animal um, or living being. I don't want to call them animal because they're not in the animal kingdom. They're, whatever your world, you decide how you want to do it. You just want them sitting around your, your room because you like uh, cute mushroom things that uh, like one looks like a ghost, one looks like a troll. There's all kinds of craziness that uh, maybe you'll enjoy. They might not even look out of place on this uh, lost biolab out in the future. This looks like something that uh, the xenomorphs have taken over, but it fits within the open lock uh, system. So you can get any other types of terrain from them and have it all fit together. Uh, print them off yourself however you feel the need to. I think it looks really awesome, uh, but I'm a fan of Alien and uh, I think putting some uh, some goop, that water effect stuff, make it all look super slimy, or maybe some extreme gloss uh, res uh, varnishes would uh, keep it everything looking like it's like humid and and uh, sweaty and funky. And why not throw some xenomorphs as well? The um, There is an alien RPG out there that is licensed from Fox, whoever owns the, uh, the, the stuff from Ridley Scott. Um, they uh it, it's been popular it's at my friendly local game store they seem to be selling pretty well and uh why not throw in some predators to go along with it so this one i wasn't sure if it belonged here or in the board game episode but i ultimately decided that it should go here because it's more of a game book so it's like a solo rpg this is metal heroes and the fate of rock if you wanted to play more of the brutal legend style of world where um you have to use the power of heavy metal and rock and roll to make your way through some type of uh, problem in a fantasy world. This should continue that kind of feel. I don't know uh, necessarily how uh, crazy it gets, how dark it gets. Um, 720 pages, so it's pretty far in depth. Um, if this is something that you think you need, if you want to be able to play through in a solo game book or be able to push this out and utilize it because you got some, some metalheads in your game group, then uh, maybe you'll be able to incorporate more folks into the decisions and play through it, maybe even more than once. And then we have some accessories for A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. Uh, I'm not sure if this is different than the one that Cool Mini or Not put out. It might be the same one. I sold my whole pledge to somebody that had got just gotten their stimulus check and I was like, please t take it. It's been sitting here for a year. I'm never going to get a chance to play it. And they were very, very happy at their purchase. Uh, and maybe this would be a great opportunity for them to pick up some interesting accessories to go along with it. There are tokens. There are pre-painted uh, markers and miniatures and different things. And um, ways to keep your, uh, your uh, factions together. Um, there's lots of different 
special colored dice, um, other crazy things. So I know it's not necessarily an RPG kind of thing, but it's an accessory, and that's what we do a lot of on this channel. And you may be able to utilize it in a different RPG. Uh, I know that there are some other Game of Thrones uh, games out there that it may fit for, or just about anything that fits within a, a fantasy medieval world. You might uh, enjoy some of these pieces. You can use the story hooks and other kinds of cool stuff. Then if you need a cool lycanthrope miniature to paint and have on your uh, shelf, maybe you want it to be a Wendigo, uh, I'm not going to make that decision for you. You can swap out the faces and do other things that you want with it. This is Immortal King's Fantasy The Chosen. They uh, have not sculpted it yet. They have some ideas that they've uh, uh, drawn out as to how they want it to be. And uh, if you're interested in this, they've created a few different Kickstarters in the past. And uh, if you're interested in this type of sculpt, I don't know if it would necessarily be the type of thing that you would put in your Werewolf Apocalypse campaign. Um, but I think it'd be something that's cool on the shelf that could tell people that you're into these type of uh, lycanthropes. Then if the world wasn't metal enough for you and you needed your own metal bullet dice, then uh, here you go. Um, things I would say to you, these are only D6s, there's nothing else. Uh, that I've seen as far as the the shapes uh, and what's going on there so you you'd use them only for a game that utilizes d6s very heavily I think uh, Savage Worlds would be a good one for that or maybe you just want it for a particular type of damage that would be pretty cool I'm not gonna stop you from doing that kind of fun stuff what I will stop you from doing is taking these to the airport do not do that um, be cognizant of where you take something that's in the shape of a potentially lethal device even though it's not possible for these to fire uh, people do get a little skittish even at the shape of things so uh, i've had so many like keychains and other things taken at the airport because they have no sense of humor and they don't care you're just gonna have to get another one but if you're gonna just play at home and uh, you're okay with rolling these guys out i will say the same thing i say to everybody about the metal dice though Make sure it's not going to nick your table or shatter whatever glass table of anything that you're going to play on. Uh, if these go uh, flying, then uh, they're still made out of metal, so they might break stuff. Then one of the people that helped make Red Dragon in has a new sci-fi role-playing game that is trying to take a more comedic tone. And, uh, you know, if you're otherwise not playing Traveler or uh, Starfinder... Or, uh, I don't know, any of the other uh, uh, stuff you could be playing. <laughs> Palladium, lots of other options are out there. Uh, then maybe you'll pick up this one. They have their own types of dice. They have their own types of... Uh, uh, just the look of everything makes it feel a lot more cartoony. So uh, if you're fine with that kind of look, if you're fine with it being um, more along the, the funny side... Not necessarily fully into that that kind of world, but in the accessible cartoony uh, fun side and not into like a heavy science RPG. Like you're not trying to push into the expanse, more like Star Trek Lower Decks than, uh, than that. Um, you probably might enjoy Boldly Go and uh, explore the universe. Why not? And maybe you want to explore a different style of mini. Maybe you want to explore a different style of... Uh, of um, feel to your table and that's what dice heads comes in they take a lot of iconic DD style monsters and they chippy them up for you so you can get this baby bird bear obviously based on an owl bear but they can't say owl bear because that's copyrighted by uh, dungeons and dragons it may not be in the srd but they can make other types of sculpts that look pretty neat um there's like a baby beholder and other things you can see there on the right if this uh, may be more accessible to different types of people that are sitting around your table that might not like all the blood, guts, and gore of um, the other types of models that are out there and available. They need something that's going to be a little bit less scary, and that'll get them to uh, show up more often. So stuff to think about as far as that goes. Um, it's useful to have a wide variety of things that you can pull from and uh, give everybody a really good time. And like I said before, on being pre-supported, you can get them uh, that way. It all comes however you need it. Or uh, if you prefer to uh, mess with that kind of thing yourself, 
that you can uh, get it without the supports. Uh, I like to save it some time, but uh, that depends on how much you want to mess with it. Then I'm not really sure how big skate culture is in uh, Japan. Uh, I don't even see a skateboard in here, but somehow that seems to be uh, what's going on. Maybe they're roller skates, maybe they're ice skates, not skateboards. Summon Skate is an indie Japanese RPG that they want translate into translated into English. And uh, if that's something that looks like it would be appealing to you, then by all means, jump in on there. Anime is not necessarily anything I know much about um, or why anyone would need it. And you would not want to see me on a skateboard, ice skate, roller skate, roller blade. It's just... Uh, so much falling and injuries <laughs> that's all I remember from there so my uh, center of gravity is far too high I need like a lower center of gravity to not be flopping around all the time like uh, my, my belly's too big I think um, but if you're into this kind of thing and you're, you want a Japanese import but you don't speak Japanese well enough to uh, bring it to the table here's a great opportunity for you to enjoy this one then we have a little bit less cute sci-fi. This is the last outpost. There's a bunch of different objects of a bunch of different sizes, including people and uh, different types of vehicles and other crates. Lots and lots of crate styles. So uh, that'll help keep things from getting too weird. I think they're modular enough where you can snap them together in different ways so you can uh, mix and match what kind of crates you need. Um, so. Yeah, whatever environment, you can uh, create different cities, different styles, uh, depending on which uh, motifs you uh, employ most heavily. And uh, that part's pretty cool. So you can create uh, pretty much the whole world uh, with uh, whatever it is that you might need for a station, be it for Firefly or any of the uh, Starfinder, Pathfinder, not Pathfinder, Traveler, or any of the other uh, types of uh, spacefaring games that are out there. And if you're going for something that is a little more cartoony in the sense that there are more curves and less structurally sound, but uh, possibly more fun in your uh, various buildings, you want them to be more fantasy, something that fits those chibi styles a little bit better, or um, humble wood, whatever uh, other thing that you've got, something that's a little more whimsy to it. City of Firwood may have the types of houses that you're interested in uh, 3D printing out. You can go up with the interiors, exteriors, however it is that you want to do them. Um, you can even mess with the scale because you're printing it yourself. So that kind of stuff is neat. If you are going to mess with the scale, just be consistent so everything fits together. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. You can probably get away with FDM with no problem on this because it's such a, a large piece. Even though it does have a lot of curves and whatnot, uh, architecture is a little bit more forgiving than minis would be with FDM. And if you got some established characters and you want to play something spooky, this is Before the Stroke of Midnight, a mystery adventure inspired by L Edgar Allan Poe for 5e. You can play it in, in Ravenloft, you can play it uh, with Strahd, you can play it wherever you want, or you can play it instead of those things. This is a level 9 adventure, so your characters should be pretty well established at this point. However, they say that they've also included ideas on how to keep it scalable. I think it might be fun just to be able to just do it as a one shot jump in and uh, play through as level nine if you've never gotten characters that far uh, before maybe it'll get more people um, to enjoy the game a bit more because they're, they're almost uh, to the most people end a campaign by level 10 it's kind of like a huge drop off point so you start at nine and you're already at the point where you'd uh, be close to the end and uh, by the time you get through all 80 pages of the book you might be encouraged to go a little further and do more cool stuff. If you're buying all these horror minis and, and you're enjoying all this horror stuff, you might as well have some uh, types of uh, mysterious, fun, exciting, and entertaining classic uh, <laughs> types of adventures to go on with all that cool stuff you've bought. And apropos to that kind of world, you could get the Gift of the Grave and have lots of scattered terrain and mausoleums and all that kind of cool stuff, gates, cemeteries, that kind of business, ready to go in case you end up in that type of situation. If you need something spooky, nothing spookier than what you can find in a graveyard.
And maybe you're looking for a different type of storytelling. This is Vice and Virtue. Um, as you can see, it, there's a lot of stuff that can be done with the app. And, but it's tarot inspired. You can use it with any system. It is entirely neutral. Basically, it's like an online zine that uh, has some uh, different rules that you can utilize. You can check them out right now if you choose to do so. And uh, maybe uh, work out the major arcana in uh, a totally different way instead of telling you the future then it'll help you figure out like a whole new path and uh, you know just different ways to use tarot decks they are interesting the artwork looks pretty cool on a lot of them I've got a Salvador Dali one sitting in uh, a drawer somewhere so uh, lots of people have a kind of thing or you can just use regular playing cards too and uh, just swap out a couple different things and uh, just say it's tarot and basically they come from the same place so it shouldn't be that difficult to uh, to make it work for you. Especially if you're using the, the X of Swords. I don't know if you're reading the uh, X-Men comics that are out right now. It's a big tarot-based thing of a war, Apocalypse, uh, and Krakoa are all thrown together. Maybe this will help you uh, create that kind of world if you were running a superhero comic uh, book campaign with something like Heroes Unlimited or Mutants and Masterminds. Then we have the mutants and mullets of the Neon Lords of the Toxic Wasteland. And this is a uh, book about an apocalypse that would have happened in 1992. So all of the things from the 80s somehow maintain themselves and uh, people are still fighting back. There are a lot of different classes. I think it's its own system. Um, so it, uh, the BX rules, I don't know what the BX are, but uh, whatever those are then feel free to utilize them. I'll look it up later. Uh, but for now, you can uh, employ style, such as your hairstyle somehow also affects the, the way that you play your game. You can uh, uh, play a Brutacorn, so somehow that's like a, a mullet or a, a, I don't know, some type of unicorn system that's also a barbarian. Um, cosmic barbarian, you get the dwarflings and night stalkers and star spawns and war wizards and then a super secret class that somehow and all that kind of cool stuff it's neat um the osric uh, uh kind of style on the art uh is appealing to a lot of folks it's simple enough but wacky enough i think to bring to your table at least for a couple of adventures and just go all balls the wall 80s uh, album cover style and then we had uh, Chibi Style for D&D, &D, and now we have it for COC. This is Gangster Bang 2.0 Cthulhu, and uh, you'll be able to have a very cartoony style with big head chibis, or, you know, more normal style, uh, anthrop uh, regular um, anatomy style uh, ones that will fit pretty well in a 1920s America to fight against the various uh, creatures of Lovecraft's mythos and uh you can go either way with it i think they'll be fun to paint and uh, you can use these guys if so required there's not too much going on that would uh, date these guys specifically to the 20s it could just be like a, a townsperson if uh, you like to utilize um, these guys for that uh the airplane though that's definitely not going to be in your regular campaign but chairs, some bottles, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can use that for scattered terrain in a lot of different places. And uh, grave diggers. If you bought all that uh, grave stuff that was in the, the other campaigns for terrain, then maybe you need somebody to occupy that. And that's been a little while since we've heard from Satanic Panic Miniatures, but they are back with some multi-part giants. So you can swap out giant heads and bodies and arms and limbs. And make them however you want. If you go into the lore of giants, um, this is more for old school RPGs, but you could go and look up all different types of personalities uh, from Ettons to Hill Trolls, sorry, to, to Hill Giants, uh, all the way up to the Storm Giants. Each one of them is entirely different with crazy things that they will or will not have on them. There are various levels of grooming, their body shapes. So all that's useful to swap out. As you can see, you got a lot of different types of weapons. Stole a couple swords, shoved them in a, in a branch, and made a spiked club out of it. Ingenuity uh, to different types of axes and other things. So 
when you're that big, you don't really need anything too complex for weaponry because you're that big. But uh, sometimes it's useful, especially when fighting other giants. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, they're not going to be 28 millimeters, but they're scaled to be in a world with 28 millimeter characters, if that's what you're into. And this might be the only dice campaign that's on this uh, episode. They've uh, 3D printed out a couple of different types. As you can see, there's a dog face, uh, there's different inclusions, and uh, there's different liquid soap packs uh, that have dice floating around in them if uh, you would like some sharp-edged dice that makes you clean or you wanted to give it as a gift to people in your group um, or people that you know or you think it might encourage them to play or whatever the case is or just wash themselves. There's a lot of reasons why you might use any of these. They make, uh, like I say, an interesting gift um, and you can get them customized as much as you think you need to. And uh, yeah, give it a go, why not? There's I didn't see any of the gelatinous cube ones on this one though. That was probably the best soap project I've ever seen, but these look pretty cool too. And then just to throw in some stuff from Massive Darkness that I painted during the week, they had some pretty cool minis in uh, that game. Uh, it's Bjorn and her name starts with a Y or a Z or something off the top of the head. It's some dwarf uh, individual and uh, they did a good job in the game of having both male and female counterparts for all of the different um, types of uh, classes that they allowed. This living construct, I went and I bought some uh, very cheap on Amazon little clockwork steampunk pieces and threw those in, used those as a base. So I liked that part of it. Overall, the sculpt I thought was a little bit difficult to tell what was going on and I wasn't able to bring too much out with the paint just because the, there's so many edges and so many different things. I was like, ah. Eh. Uh, when I got to the final bit of things I painted, it was the stuff I liked less and less. And uh, for the monsters, they, they're fine for monsters, they're just I didn't like the sculpts that much. And uh, this is one of those examples I thought could have been a little more um, interesting. The Iron Golem one, which is a kind of like a counterpart to this, I think is fantastic. Uh, it breaks a little easy, but um, you know, stuff happens. At, uh, you know, when I get down to the heroes, I think the heroes all look pretty cool. I've got three or four more left to paint and a bunch of bases left to do for the series. And I'll just keep trickling them out as we go through. You can follow my Instagram if you want to see them when I get them finished. Because I'm usually, uh, I usually take a picture right away uh, while it's still drying and uh, get them up on there. And those links are all in the uh, description if you like it. And I want to say thanks again for Crippled God Foundry for sponsoring this episode. Um, it was really, really nice of them to do so. I'm a little tiny channel, and uh, it's great that they believed in in uh, advertising with me well enough to get through to you guys, and hopefully you'll enjoy their stuff too and uh, pick some of it up. Um, you can pick, as I said, either their Patreon, which is always going, or they've got a little bit of time left, about two weeks left, on uh, the Shattered Hell Kickstarter, which you can see in the links in the description right at the top. So thank you guys for watching. If you got any comments, questions, concerns, feel free to throw those out. If there's anything you liked, if there's anything that you would like to see more of, always feel free to pop that in and uh, that'll let me know what uh, you guys are actually backing because that's helpful. You guys have a solid week. Uh, I know things have been kind of crazy here in my neck of the woods um, with all the counting and all that but I hope this is going to make a good escape for you and don't forget there is the board game episode uh, I'm going to start the render on this and then go to bed um, so I'm not sure what time in the afternoon it'll be uh, by the time that the board game episode's done but you can always check back in or hit the uh, subscribe button and you'll be notified when uh, that pops in in a few hours after this one you guys have a good one